Welcome to a video that has been corrupted by its contents. Anyone may lose oneself in the search of forbidden lore. The champions of chaos are some of the vilest beings in existence. And today, we will go deep in the exploration of their history and their greatest deeds. Beware as you consume the contents of this episode, as it contains evil knowledge. Knowledge that would break those with a feeble mind. Today we will explore some of the most powerful of these characters, and how they have stained the annals of history. We will learn names that resound across the mortal and immortal planes. Names that are feared across all realms. Names like Kugath, Plague Father, Sigvald the Magnificent, Kolak, Sun Eater, Skarbrand. The Demon Prince Azazel, Festus the Leech Lord, Village the Curseling, Valkia the Bloody, and Archaon the Ever Chosen, the Bringer of the Apocalypse. This video has timestamps embedded in it, so you can skip to your favorite Champion of Chaos. But before we begin, we want to extend our gratitude to the ones that have joined our Patreon page, or our YouTube channel membership, or have supported the channel in any way over the last few weeks. We thank you for watching and enjoying the content. If you want to get your legendary title, you will be more than happy to hear about today's video sponsor. Established Titles is a fun way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland, helping global reforestation efforts, and also makes for a unique gift. Their title packs let you buy at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland and an official certificate with a crest. All the available title packs are based on the historic Scottish land ownership custom where you can declare yourself as a lord or lady, which are the Scottish terms for a landowner. You could officially change your name to lord or lady and get it on your credit card plane tickets, or elsewhere. You can even get it on your dating profiles. Not only that, but by purchasing your own plot of land, established titles plants a tree with every order through partnerships with One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future charities. Established titles has told us that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using our link will effectively be next to our plot. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our own Book of Choir Kingdom. Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, you can use our code CHOIR to get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com forward slash CHOIR to get your gifts now and to help support the channel. I am Sigvald the Magnificent, the Gerald Prince of Slanesh. From birth, Sigvald defied the very laws of the world with his mere existence. Even as a baby, he was angelically magnificent, and his head was already full with golden strands of hair. He was born beautiful beyond reason but had one small, almost unnoticeable mutation. A horned mark on the back of his neck that surely omened what was to come. 
His father was a powerful warrior king, a man known for his acts of excess and devotion to carnal desire. And as such, Sigvald was born into a life of unnatural acts and excesses. The king's court fulfilled the prince's every desire, until, even from a young age, he demanded more than what mere mortals could provide him. Sigvald came to even surpass the perversions of his own father, when his fondness for man-flesh was discovered, he was banished, and he left, but only to cover his father in a veil of false safety, which he then used to assassinate the man in his sleep using his own blade. Then, satisfied with his depraved acts, he left for the Chaos Wastes, declaring that a man such as him was destined for glorious things, things far greater than whatever the mortals could offer him. And indeed, he thrived in his travels to the Chaos Wastes. So handsome was he that even beasts stopped to gaze upon his glorious image. Trolls, wolves, men and demons like and soon enough, he devoted himself to Slanesh, the god of pleasure and excess. Hundreds of winters later, he walks at the head of an army of almost equally beautiful followers, for the prince slaughters all of those who he thinks ugly, annoying, or simply unworthy of breathing the same air as him, and with a swift flick of his rapier, named Silver Slash, that was forged from a small sliver of Slanesh's own blade. He fells enemies twice, thrice even, his size, with such an elegance to his moods that it truly seems like an awe-inspiring artistic performance of death. His plated suit, the auric armor, was granted to him by Slanesh himself, made from ensorcelled pure gold, with intricate patterns and engravings, all crafted to perfection. It pulses with tendrils of dark energies, that tenderly caress Sigvald's skin, closing any wounds with a soft and lustful kiss. The auric armor is baroque in its lustful design, shining with gilded glow, even in the most terrible of battlefields. His boots are of the most beautiful craftsmanship. They glide one inch off the ground, so that Sigvald may never be tainted by mud, blood, or any other filthy elements that the world is full of. His golden hair is impeccable, long, thick, and blonde. It matters not what atrocities the prince commits. His hair does not seem to stay, and his locks are ever flowing gracefully in the wind, like a golden flame. The very air around him is perfumed to an extreme only the most devoted of Slanesh's servants may truly appreciate. For intruders, this air is tempting at first, but quickly becomes intoxicating. The ground itself bows to Sigvald as he advances, the land reshaping itself to allow the prince to pass, so that his gait does not alter itself from its glorious and elegant ways. Every single one of his bodyguards, almost as beautiful as himself, 
carry a mirrored shield so that the prince may look at his amazing visage on the battlefield and whisper sweet things to himself. Only the goddess knows what he says in those moments of pure, unadulterated ecstasy. The followers of Slanesh are decadent in the extreme and revel in their own outrageousness. Many of them wear garish colors, delicate clothing and flowing robes, offsets with leather or fur, draped and adorned with fine gold or silver chains. The ones who are favored by their god are often given mutations and mighty skills to excel on the battlefield. They find the act of murder a delicious treat that must be cherished. Resembling a macabre dance, the warriors of Slanesh perform on the battlefield with flawless grace. The more effective the killing blow, the more pleasure these twisted warriors feel in the core of their being. The more pain they can inflict upon their foes, the sweeter the reward granted by their patron god. Those who bear the mark of Slanesh have experienced sensations beyond comprehension and are now insensible to mere mortal fears. Who would resist taking such a glorious gift from she who thirsts? Who could possibly resist the sweetest of temptations? Ah, my loyal minions. Over the way stands something I want. It is only right I take it from him. And if you, my serfs, die in agony during the attempt then know that I'll feel your pain. Why, I will relish it! As we fought these abominable warriors, we could see the twisted features in their faces and the modifications they had made upon their own bodies. They screamed with pleasure when they took us down. The dreaded sound was a strange mix of celebration and primal screams of ecstasy. They also laughed as they killed as if they knew they were going to win the battle. And for them it was only a matter of seeing who could kill more, or who could kill more elegantly. And they danced as they killed. Or at least so it seemed. Many of us were confused by these shenanigans. Some were infuriated by these acts. And they fought with even more determination stubborn in their duty to fend off these dark foes. But many others lost heart, including me. I have felt terrible ever since. A coward I have been named. But they, they didn't see all the things that I saw on that day. They didn't hear the terrible chants and screams of these warriors of chaos. Do I regret running away? The shame and the burden I carry for the rest of my days are all mine to bear, and the nightmares will continue to haunt me in my dreams forever. That I, I certainly know. But I wouldn't be here today telling you about all this if I hadn't run away as fast as I could. I panicked. I ran for my life, and I regret that. I wait for the day I can face those monsters again and redeem myself in the eyes of Ulrich. When the time comes, I will embrace death and go out seeking the sons of Slanesh. They will feel my wrath as I deliver vengeance for all the friends and fellow warriors they killed on that battlefield. I will have my redemption. One way or another. And I feel that day 
is coming soon. Have you ever looked at the mirror and felt that your reflection somehow looked back at you? Not at you per se, but through you, begging you to come closer to see all of your small facets, to reach through the mirror and catch it. What is it? Perfection, utter and complete magnificence. The sweet whispers of the God of Seduction beckons you to come closer, and throughout history many have answered, but none so completely as Sigvald, the Magnificent. He looks like the very definition of the words, handsome young man, but he is indeed older than me. And who am I, you ask? I am but a simple elf servant to his handsomeness, here to fulfill his every wish, his every desire on a whim, and I am not alone, for his mere image inspires loyalty upon those who seek the utmost absolute perfection in all things. All of those who follow Sigvald into battle know one truth that they will get to experience the most extreme of pleasures when they win and bring glory to she who thirsts. Raise buildings and sing songs in my glory. In my name, pursue your arts and enshrine all beauty. Let all people follow their every desire, sate their every hunger, and deny themselves no adventure. For it is in these things, and in no other, that you will find the greatest pleasure. And it is through these things, and through each other, that you shall rise yourselves higher, even unto the steps of my throne. You will take pleasure in all that is, though your bodies will break, and your souls be forfeit. For I am Selesh, most jealous of gods, and most demanding of lovers, and my thirst for you shall never be sated. Sigma, protect us all. In the flashes of lightning, I saw a scaled leg scrabble against the rock as the thing stood upright. It walked past me without even bothering to glance at me. Last I saw it, it was scaling straight up a cliff. I saw others like it, wading at the summit of a mountain, their forms throwing massive shadows across the mountains as they fought amidst the lightning. I have never been back to Icebreak Ridge since. In this episode, we will learn about the terrible creatures that are the Dragon Ogres, and also about one of the oldest amongst them, Colic Sun Eater, a dark beast that makes the world tremble with his wrath. The Dragon Ogres are creatures that have lived for eons. Their incredible longevity as with almost all things supernatural, is the work of the Chaos Gods. Ages ago, the elders of their ancient race made a pact with the ruinous powers, embracing damnation in order to save themselves from a slow, inevitable decline into full extinction. They were given eternal life, and in return, the entire Dragon Ogre race put themselves at the command and service of the Dark Gods. Since that day, the Dragon Ogres have carved their names across the ages as immortals who can only die in battle. Monstrous beings that rouse themselves only in the name of destruction. They spend the majority of their lives in slumber under the mountains, places darker than midnight, where no ray of sun has ever reached. 
Legends say that it is only when terrible thunderstorms assail the crests of the world that they finally stir and come to life. As lightning streaks across the skies, the dragon ogres scale mountains and glaciers. They do this in order to bathe in the fulminating lightning, rejoicing in the raw forces of nature. For it is the storm that invigorates them and fills them with deadly energy for their coming battles. The most feared amongst their number is the massive dragon ogre known as Kolek, Sun Eater. When the dragon ogres made their unholy pact with the ruinous powers, the world became dark, as if foreseeing the dire future to come. Little detail is known of that dark and ancient contract. Yet, it is said that the deeds of Kolek during that pact were so heinous and beyond evil that the sun itself hid its face behind a bank of storm clouds as it decreed that it would henceforth never shine upon Kolek again, hiding forever behind an impenetrable bank of storm clouds. True enough, Kolek's coming is heralded by roiling black thunderheads, heavy storms and blackness. Although little is known of Kolek's birth and the early years of his life, it is well established fact that this hulking and monstrous being is one of the firstborn kin to Krakenrock the Black, father to all dragon ogres making him truly ancient, beyond the reckoning of mortals and many others alike. Kolik Sun Eater, like the rest of his breed, slumbers beneath the stone of the northern mountains, until once every eight generations, the sonorous chanting of demented worshippers perform their nefarious rites and hurl the carcasses of their vile sacrifices into their cavernous lairs. It is then during the climax of a storm of otherworldly proportions that the Sun Eater bursts forth to wreak havoc upon the old world. Like all dragon ogres, Kolek is a beast of such colossal size that mere mortals can scarcely comprehend. It is said he dwarfs buildings and settlements alike. Indeed, it is rumored that Kolek himself stands so tall he can clearly see over the ramparts and gates of cities. Indeed, legends say he was last seen standing over the walls of the cursed city of Prague during the Great War against Chaos. Such is his size that he smashed asunder the temples and buildings of many cities with his immense war hammer, Star Crusher, a weapon forged in the fiery heart of a raging volcano and enchanted with ancient and mysterious energy so that it is capable of slaying even the stars themselves. In keeping with the nature of all dragon ogres, this monster wears indomitable armor. It is made of enormous brass plates, now blackened and charred. Thanks to Kolek's age, he has seen a millennia of war and has absorbed the great lightning strikes required to keep his race both physically and mentally empowered. Even now, there are rumors that the Herald of the Storm 
is once more abroad in the northern lands. His gigantic warhammer star crusher in hand to bring down ruinous and brutal fury that has only grown since before the dawn of man. As the lines crashed and the battle heated on, the skies turned black, as if nature and the warmth of the sun removed itself from the world. Suddenly I saw a group of dragon ogres charging through the terrible arms of chaos are known to use these ancient beasts as assault forces, but I've never seen them with my own eyes. Uh, I damn that moment to this day. The green things that I'm living alike will bear witness to my wrath. They are mine to dismember, to disembowel, to cross. I will smash all that remains of these ruins to powder and not stop until my hammer is found! And then the whole world will burn before I rest again. Such is my rage! This is the new pact I make to the Dark Powers! The Dragon Ogres charged through our ranks breaking our shields and sending many of us flying through the air. Many of my brothers, broken and dead, before they even hit the ground. The arrows and bullets we fired did not deter them. Many of them shrugged off cannonballs and shots that would have killed a man many times over. Their weapons were gigantic, and they roared as they broke our ranks with terrible ferocity and pure force. Before long, many regiments were fleeing, running for their lives in full panic. I ran too, and that's why I'm here today. Days later, we learned that all had stayed to fight, died, crushed under the terrible weight of their dark army of chaos. How are we supposed to survive if we are to fight against those ancient monsters? Come, take my hand. There is no wish of yours I cannot grant. No desire. I cannot fulfill. Forget your gods, your family, your loved ones. What can they offer you? I can give you more than you have ever dreamed of. I have such things to show you, such pleasures for you to taste. There is no love greater than mine. Come now, join me. It is such an easy step, such a short climb. Yes, that's it. Come to me, my champion. Stay forever.
Azazel was born a mortal man under the name Jarian of the Umbarajan tribe, alongside his twin, Trinavantes, and his elder sister, Ravenna. When still young, Jarian's mother was told a chilling prophecy. Only one of her sons would know the greatest extremes of pleasures and the most enticing extremes of pain. As the boys grew to manhood, they would eventually find themselves in the retinue of mighty Sigmar himself, fighting alongside him. But this glory was not meant to last. It happened that in a deadly battle against the Greenskins, Trinavantis was slain. Jarian was lost in his grief over the loss of his brother, and he blamed Sigmar for his death. It was then that the tormented Jarian swore his vengeance against the king. As time passed after the incident, Jarian himself grew so close to Sigmar that he began to feel conflicted, recognizing the inherent nobility of Sigmar and his brethren, and he began to doubt his own oath to seek revenge. But six years later, the time had finally arrived for Jarian to at last strike Sigmar and attempt to take revenge. And struck he did. With a poisoned blade, Jarian wounded Sigmar, but in the confusion and chaos of the situation, he also mistakenly slew his own sister, Ravenna, who was betrothed to the king. Plagued by guilt for his actions, Jarian fled to the north as a fugitive, having left Sigmar hovering on the very brink of death. While in his self-imposed exile in the far north, he found sanctuary with the Norsei, a tribe whose numbers had been nigh on annihilated during battle with none other than Sigmar Heldenhammer and his men. Among their survivors was a powerful sorcerer who had foretold the coming of one who would be a great champion of chaos, and so bestowed upon Jarian a new name, the name that would one day drive fear and trepidation into the hearts of those who hear it, Azazel. Azazel would devote himself to the Prince of Chaos, Slanesh, with his newfound powers and dark motivations. He slew many enemies from all races. One of the most remarkable was the slaying of Arthur, the exalted champion of Khor, who Azazel killed in single combat. Pleased with his might and devotion to the arts of excess, Slanesh in return elevated Azazel to demonhood as his demon prince and made him the commander of one of the Slaneshi demonic armies, the Ecstatic Legion. Blessed by Slanesh, Azazel is second in beauty only to the gods themselves. He boasts great polished horns that curve out from his brow and beautiful pure white wings. In his right hand he carries an enchanted demonic blade that writhes as if alive. It is a sword that no armor can ever hope to deflect.
The beast has a sickening beauty that can drive any man or woman mad. In fact, there are a few legends and tales that make up this argument. One of the most famous being when a questing knight called Guido de Brion went on a mission to kill Azazel, only to kneel before the beauty and splendor of the demon. His head was separated from his shoulders in one quick slice, and the questing knight didn't even try to move or defend himself. In his mind, the act was truly justifiable, or how could he resist against that excessive beauty? It is said, too, in hushed whispers, that the beast can see the deepest desires and hidden pleasures of all mortals, and look into the most private corners of their hearts. As such, the terrible and varied temptations that the demon whispers are nearly irresistible. Now, Azazel wanders the battlefields of the old world, slaughtering with reckless abandon on wings of pure alabaster. One champion of chaos, who has seemingly fallen further than most, is a doctor. Bestus, the Leech Lord, once a skilled chirurgeon, who founded hospices across the province of Nordland. With his abilities, he cured hundreds of wounded and sick men and women with his many recipes curative solutions, salves, and unique unguents. He was as compassionate as he was gifted, and his reputation preceded him amongst renowned physicians, alchemists, and scientists across the length and breadth of the old world. But fate played a cruel hand to this once noble man. His downfall came when he was finally faced with the disease his famed potions, concoctions, and unguents could not cure. This new contagion, dubbed the Nashin Fever, spread with tremendous speed and left stacks of bodies in its wake. In desperation, the doctor retreated and locked himself in his fully equipped laboratory, where, despite his greatest efforts, he watched patient after patient shake out their last breaths and die painfully before his eyes. Finally, when the last of his patients had perished, he fell to his knees and cried out for help from any that might give it. In that dark room, heavy with the stench of death and disease, those same slack-jawed corpses each turned their dead gaze to Festus, and with one voice offered him the ability to cure any and all diseases. In exchange, for a lifetime of servitude, the plague god would bestow Festus with the knowledge necessary to cure not only this brutal gnashing fever, but all diseases that ever could and would ever be. It is important to note that many humans do not seek to initially please the Dark Gods actively. There are many reasons a human soul might turn to the worship of Chaos, 
Some of them seek a release from their lives of slavery, endless toil or hopelessness. Many others, however, desire power or influence. Whether to provide for those who depend upon them, or to reach their own ambitions, it is a slippery ladder, crowned with morally compromising choices that oftentimes begin as seemingly justified, or even a noble cause, but quickly it turns into full heresy, and by then it is far too late to step back. In the case of Dr. Festus, his choice was made out of pure desperation and the seemingly simple and noble wish to cure his patients. Thinking only of the good work he might do and how many lives he might save in the future, Festus agreed to the offered pact, and his mind was instantaneously flooded with knowledge that none but the great god Nurgle could impart. Every disease was revealed to him in an instant that truly felt like an eternity. Every cure was put at his disposal, every concoction suddenly made known to him. The knowledge of all the sickness, suffering, Rebirth and death was suddenly his. It was absolutely overwhelming. And in that moment, Festus became the Leech Lord of Nurgle, an exalted champion of Nurgle, who goes to war in the name of furthering his revolting studies. This new understanding drove every shred of his once renowned compassion from him and left Festus utterly insane. This madness was swiftly put to use in service of Grandfather Nurgle as Festus then founded the Tnean Fellowship, an imperial society of physicians which in truth sought to corrupt yet even more practitioners of the noble arts of healing into falling under the sway of Grandfather Nurgle. Before retreating to the northern wastes, Festus even used his new knowledge to devastating effect when the son of Aldebron Ludenhoff, the Elector Count of Hockland, fell ill. Disguised as a cloaked physician, the gardener of Nurgle instructed the young man to drink a mysterious potion should the symptoms of his rare illness return. And in time, the symptoms did indeed return. But when the young man drank the elixir given to him, rather than being cured, the man turned into a great slobbering mutated beast that slaughtered a score of the Electric Count's closest advisors before running north to obey the whims of its new master. Now Festus plagues the world, spreading Nurgle's gifts among any and all who he crosses paths with. This champion of chaos is a walking repository of alembics and foul-smelling potions. To the ones blessed by Grandfather Nurgle, these elixirs are restorative brews, but to others they are deadly poisons that only hurt and corrupt the body and even the soul. Not all 
of the champions of chaos have descended from such noble roots. Indeed, some have their beginnings in very dire circumstances, forcing one to wonder if some of the servants of chaos had any choice in their own fate. Or perhaps they were controlled the entire time. Village, the Cursling, had his start in similar circumstances. He and his twin brother, Thoman, were hard-born, pushing their mother to the breaking point, and inevitably killing her as they fed greedily at her breast. The twins could not be more different even from birth. Thelman was a strong, robust, and strapping boy, while his misbegotten twin was small, sickly, and runtish. These differences only grew more and more noticeable as time passed. Thelman grew stronger, greater, and more handsome. Taking to the way of the warrior with little effort, while Village struggled under the tutelage of the tribe's shaman, and soon grew to be despised, not only for his acts and mannerisms, but because he was ugly and frail, things far too intolerable for the hardy men of the tribe. It was during this time that Thoman began to beat his lesser twin for even the smallest perceived infraction. Village's father never intervened on his weaker son's behalf. This cruelty and mistreatment mingled together with his already despicable personality and it inevitably led Village to nurture and develop his resentment and hatred until finally he started praying every night that his role might be reversed and that it might be he who was the stronger twin, the one who could punish, the one who could dominate and rule over those he deserved to be above. Zinch, the god of change, in his infinite wisdom, is also the god who delights in anarchy. Eventually, he agreed to Village's selfish request. It was time for a change. One night, when the dark moon more sleeps, was full in the night sky, with the darkness drawing in in the chaos moon passing close to the world. The dark god Sinch, master of misrule and treachery, took heed of the wretch's prayers and gave him the power he sought with his usual petulant twist. What emerged from village in Thoman's tent, glowing with baleful magic light, would be the being from henceforth known as the Twisted Twin. Tsinch had fused the forms of the Twisted Village and the mighty Thoman together, bestowing magical power in village that dwarfed any of his opponents a hundred times. Thoman, as requested, became the subservient twin, his mind dulled, slowed and quiet, but not erased. His body was no longer under his own control, but full of strength out of this world and now under village's command. Instantly, the new twisted being used his new foul powers and stolen strength to slaughter countless members of his own tribe. 
the horrifyingly powerful hands of Thoman throttled the life from any who attempted to stop the great arcing bolts of magic that reduced villages' victims to little more than pools of liquefied flesh. All who had looked down upon the village felt the dire consequences of their actions. In time, the village, also known as the Cursely, hunted down all the elite warriors of his tribe, and with his new diabolical magical powers, he enslaved their minds and held them all enthralled to his own whim in a great army. The foul village now battles against every foe he can find in service to his master, the great anarchistic Tsinch. Queen of Gore demigod of war. Valkia is the bride to Korn himself. Many centuries before the rise of Sigmar, when men were still not much more than prey, she led a tribe of bloodthirsty Norskins into conflict against any who did not worship the blood god. But before all of that, she was Lil Ven, meaning little friend in her Norskin tongue, dubbed that by her warrior father, Merrick. By the age of ten, she had already fought as a shield maiden and had participated in a successful first battle. They say that when the Axe Father is pleased with our efforts, the tides of the sky will flow and ebb with the tides of the darkest red leached from the blood of our enemies. On the day that happens, live then. Our people will rise far above all others. When she became of age, her tribe had begun to be stricken by the misfortunes of fate, and her father grew sick with plague. Another tribe, farmers and fishermen all, had been maimed by their rivals and requested aid and shelter from Merrick, and he abided, physically weak from the touch of Nurgle. This action of mercy cemented the chieftain as weak in the minds and hearts of his fellow tribesmen, especially Valkia, his own daughter, who grew resentful towards the weak attitude shown by her father. Valkia had taken upon her only true mortal lover, Radic a powerful and mighty warrior, and it was Radic who ultimately struck down her weakling father. In a sudden turn of events, Valkia killed Radic too, declaring him a traitor and becoming herself the head of the tribe. She led the tribe in daring raids, eliminated anyone who opposed her, gaining the favor of Korn above all others. Valkia was a ruthless killing machine. The tribe grew, and alliances with fellow marauders were formed. In the coming winters, the ill, elderly, and weak all perished under the oppressive and unforgiving cold of the north. These were all acceptable losses, according to Valkia. 
for her mighty warriors were supposed to be able to endure the droughts of weather. Of course, being a chieftain also encompassed politics. And as time passed, she grew more and more tired of it. Eventually, she was forced by tradition to marry a fellow chieftain, Darren. And she bore him two daughters, Aris and Bellona. Valkia eventually gutted her husband, Darren, in a bloody ritual not too long after their offspring were born. Lossifax, a demon prince of Slanesh, bore the humble visage of a hooved man in purple robes when he visited Valkia. Stricken by her unnatural beauty, he demanded that Valkia kneel before him as his slave girl, so that she would no longer want for anything and her nights would forever be spent in extreme ecstasy. You could concede defeat to me now, girl. Admit that I am your better, and take your place at my side. Your days will be filled with all you desire, and your nights will be spent in pleasurable ecstasy. I'm offering you so much more than the snows of the north and the ingratitude of these barbarous people. If you come with me now, you will be a true queen. Her rage within was indeed mighty. But she contained herself, and in an act of contained hatred, she challenged the demon to a duel. Prideful and confident, the demon accepted, thinking that she would never best him. For an entire day and night, the two fought. Valkia had relinquished her crimson armor, for she had no need of it. She allowed her hatred to seep through, and the rage carried her into frenzied battle, never tiring. With a thundering spear thrust, she decapitated the demon, his head still whispering things, was affixed to a shield and Valkia swore to her tribe that she would deliver this vile skull to Korn's throne in person. A bold claim, but she followed through. She marched, like the queen she was, into hell itself. There, the demonic hosts of Slanesh assaulted her attempting to avenge the loss of their demon prince. And one by one, with time, her followers were cut down, until eventually only she remained. Every spear thrust was a demon banished. Every shield bash was a skull split. But it was not enough. She was eventually cut down, ripped apart by many a depraved form of life. And there laid Valkyrie, bloody and torn apart. With a rumble, the mountain shook. The heavens were inked with the color of blood. And the very core of the earth cried crimson roars, for Korn had noticed her monumental efforts, and from death did she return, now made into the gore queen, Valkia the Bloody, Bride of the Blood God.
with the singularly important task of bringing to his brass halls all of those who died in worthy and bloody combat. Her first act as a demon princess was to return to her old tribe, to sever her few remaining mortal ties. There she met her daughters and stepbrother, who alongside her tribe had not only survived, but thrived. With a shy smile, the Gore Queen descended upon the Marauders with her own demonic band of followers, slaughtering them all. The myths of Norska foretold the coming of the Gore Queen. She aided the Norskins in the burning of Nordl, performed bloody rituals alongside raiders against the dwarves of Karak Golg, and has claimed more skulls than can be counted. These are the champions of chaos. True abominations, twisted by their patron gods to do their bidding. They now consume the world of the living, and their thirsts for souls is at its peak. Who can possibly stand against them? Chaos has influence over everything it touches, but none other can create corruption better than the influence of Nurgle, the great grandfather of all that is corrupt and foul. It is well known that Nurgle is the great lord of decay and the master of plague and pestilence and that all things, no matter how solid and permanent they may seem, they are liable to eventual corruption and death. Even the process of birth is nothing but the precursor to destruction and decay. Since time immemorial, as Grandfather Nurgle blessed their subjects with uncountable diseases. These afflictions are too numerous to count, and too deadly to even grasp the full potential of their destructive capabilities. While many great unclean demons work and fight their way to spread virulence and disease, there is one amongst them that is set to constantly creating new poxes and afflictions. This being is so focused on breeding new virulent life that his quest for the perfect disease began upon his own creation. And his ultimate goal is to make a contagion that can even infect the gods themselves. This is how one of Nurgle's great unclean ones has spent eons tending to his decaying guard and conducting his research creating new diseases. This great unclean one will not stop until he deems his experiment perfect. This one is known as Kugarth Plague Father. Kugarth is the most favored great unclean one of the Lord of Disease himself, 
Nurgle. When Kugath is not traveling the world, finding ingredients for his innovative creations, the Plague Father stays within his home, concocting new and devastating diseases, constantly perfecting them, constantly remaining unsatisfied at his own work, always in search for the perfect mix or the perfect blend. Like a chef tends to a garden to have the freshest and most interesting of ingredients. The Plague Father has his own garden of virulence, which gives him access to all currently known pathogens, either naturally created or artificially made by Kugath himself. It is said that most demons despise the mortal world, yet Kugath is fascinated by it, seeing the realm as a new frontier, where he can search at his leisure for deadly ingredients and additions to his plagues. In the mortal world, the raw material is plenty, and the imagination of the greatest of unclean ones is wild and unpredictable. Countless are the poor specimens of all races trapped in Nurgle's garden to serve a higher purpose. Bones are broken, skin is peeled, and flesh is torn apart to be mixed with unknown ingredients. One example of his research findings is the ability to increase the virulence of the horrid red pox by adding ground bladders belonging to the terrifying Skaven. While most demons work to one day destroy the mortal realm, the Plague Father sees it as a necessity to complete his life's work. And while he constantly exposes it to the newest batch of plague he concocted, he will never truly destroy it, as it would be akin to a farmer destroying his plot of land and his crops forever. The mortal world is Kugath's own sandbox, the perfect place to find victims and additions to his cauldron. Like most of the great unclean ones, Kugath Plague Father originated as one of the countless Nurglings, miniature avatars of Nurgle himself, to which devote their existence to the tending of the Plague Lord. It was through his ever-strong devotion that he was chosen by the plagued grandfather himself to ascend and become an unclean one, and soon a great one. After his transformation, the plague father started leading legions of deadly demon forces, both throughout the demon realms as well as those belonging to the mortal species, constantly working to shower the immaterial and the material world with the gifts of Nurgle. Ox play, boobos and bile, every gift will make you smile. For even just one taste of sweet decay, you will just want to sit here and stay. When leading a demonic host, Kugath sits atop a massive throne known as a palanquin that is carried by a horde of nurglings, which also act as weapons when dunked into Kugath's own vat of whatever new brew he has concocted. They are thrown at enemies, which inflict horrific damage 
and decay to them. Kogath is also no novice to melee combat, as strength and resilience come with the massive size of the plague fog. As well as eons spent being surrounded and affected by every known pox, virus, and infection that exists. In battle, Kugath also has access to the lore of Nurgle where he can bestow gifts and blessings, as Nurgle's followers call them, to invigorate and support his own allies, while decimating and destroying those that would oppose him. No one is safe from the gifts of Nurgle, bestowed by the Plague Father himself, where the victims include, but are not limited to, those of Britonia, the Empire, the Dawi, the Lizardmen, Greenskins, and many, many more. Disease and putrefaction, the inevitable entropic decline of all things, these are the favors he bestows upon the world. It was Kugath who led the diseased legions of demons on an assault against the dwarves' capital, Karaz A. Karak, as the mere existence of a mortal race with an inert resistance and tolerance to disease and the natural cycle of life and death is an affront to the purpose of Kugath as well as his master. Those of mortal races are not the only ones to come to blows with the champion of Nurgle. For Kugath has led conquests and engagements even with other demons, especially those that follow the Lord of Change, Zinch. This is because while Nurgle represents disease, decay, stagnation, and death, Zinch embodies change, sorcery, and eternity. Nurgle has even battled with those of the far Grand Cathay, a kingdom known for their stalwart defenses and impenetrable walls. However, it was Nurgle's army, led by Kugath, that truly tested the formidable defenses, and eventually claimed victory. And so it is that Kugath continues to work, hoping one day he will complete his goal in breeding such a deadly and infectious plague that even the gods cannot withstand its virulence. Perhaps now, looking back at the events of that accursed year, it was obvious that the village of Arnsberg was doomed to fall into the hands of the enemy. The youngest ones were the first to notice, as it was only natural, for their pets fell sick or fled, and even the fleas and ticks on their fur died of plague. Then, as the village was forced to partake in a mass of burial of animals, the streets became cleaner for only a couple of days. Distinctly so, as the rats had also vanished. The trees were still, for even the wind seemed to be afraid to blow past the village and the sun had become shy, being covered by dark clouds. But no rain came, as if afraid to visit humble Arnsberg, and nobody would fault them. No rain ever came, 
and it was awfully dry. The people, especially the old folk, had become strange, and their very bodies had begun to change, in the beginning in subtle ways, but as time passed, it became clearer that something was afflicting the place. Many had been executed by the Church of Sigmar on charges of mutation, corruption, and dark contracts with distant, nigh eldritch and bizarre beings. The cattle, too, were cursed as the cows went mad and began eating each other, consuming even their own offspring, and with their horns impaling each other with primal savagery. But the goats did worse things to each other, things too abhorrent to even mention. And the crops, oh, the crops had human features on them. They were inedible, but they seemed to have a life of their own, and they whispered in agony. They were all mercifully put down. The river had become a sick green color, and birds had begun falling lifeless from the sky before disappearing completely. The sky was dead, and finally the rain came, and it did not stop. The world was sobbing for the strange fate of Arnsberg. Clearly the village needed help, and local Templars of Sigmar offered to quest along the main road to seek holy respite and indeed, the village cheered them on as heroes. In truth, many of the villagers were being eaten by Father Gascoigne, the local priest of Sigmar. He had fallen to corruption, and he was declared a heretic after being discovered. He was hunted down like a dog, and for many a night, did he stalk the streets in nearby forests, hiding like the loathsome man-eater he had become. Eventually, he was found dead, bursting from the inside out with pus. And all who had been in contact with the body died shortly thereafter, and the crows who feasted upon it mutated into hideous creatures. Food had run out, and the people were desperately fleeing, and it was found that, to outside eyes, they were already too far gone, and it did not take long for the authorities to arrive. An imperial army laid siege to the expiring city in an effort to contain the pestilence and corruption. The dead, the dying, the rotting, and worse, littered the perpetually wet street as the plague arrived. And alongside its zealous madmen who carried with them bells that tolled for the dead. With the church gone, Insane doctors attempted leeching treatments on the people, attempting their experiments on the poor first, who were also the first to go. People died with each passing day, as the situation became worse and worse. Strangely though, some seemed to not fall from the sickness, but instead rose up and began to gather those and preach the words of the Great Grandfather, an entity not known to many of their peers. They preached that his angels would come and save the village, that this was a gift 
and that the army outside was from the false gods, Sigmar and Ulrich, and that they should not fear them, for Grandfather would take care of everything. The survivors now indeed, strengthened by the plague instead of being weakened by it, gathered whatever arms and armor they could find, and sallied out to meet the Imperial Army. But what they saw was nothing but a field of the dead, rotting, a feast for the crows and even more dreadful creatures. Instead of soldiers from the Empire, they saw the living dead, hawkswalkers and more. All needed to be killed, to be saved, and a bloody battle began. And there, in the middle of the carnage, was a beautiful angel, surrounded by cupids and cherubim. Bloated and blessed by sickness, he called himself Kugath, and with a tender, warm hug, he led the survivors to a paradise where salvation awaited, where they would forever serve their grandfather Nurgle with a smile on their face. The great and powerful Chaos Gods each have their mighty and immeasurable hordes of demons to do their will. Yet some are greater than others and have greater legends and strike more fear into the hearts of demons and mortals alike. One such greater demon is the colossal Scarbrand, the exalted bloodthirster, often known as the wrathful reaper, the drinker of blood, and, in his later days, the Exiled One. Like all his kind, Scarbrand was imbued with a portion of the power of the blood god Korn himself, making him a warrior of unparalleled violence, power, and sheer force of will. It was he who tore down the great gates of Slaanesh's first palace and wreaked bloody ruin within. It was he who led the eight hosts of murder against uncountable enemy forces and decimated them in an endless ocean of gore. Yet for all his powers of war and battle, Scarbrand fell against his own floor, and that would see him humbled beyond measure. Scarbrand was arrogant subject to immense hubris and such rage that was actually palpable and painful to the body. These flaws were bolstered, nurtured and fanned by scenes to such extremes that the exalted bloodthirster attempted to battle his patron god himself, challenging his might by striking the blood god when he was facing the other way. A terrible mistake. For all his power and strength, Scarbrand could never overthrow the mighty Korn, and for his transgression against his own master and creator, he was stripped of all his wits and personality. Left only with his great rage, Scarbrand would begin wandering the immortal and mortal realms alike, in search of skulls to heap upon the Blood God's throne. In the time since the Lord of Skulls hurled the sinful demon from the highest parapet of the Brass Citadel and out of his presence forevermore, Scarbrand has done naught but wreak bloody havoc with an ever-growing devotion and intensity. So numerous are his victories before and after his exile that they are simply impossible to count as they traverse time and space. Yet there are some few moments that stand apart in his long and storied history, such as when he was summoned by the foolish Skaven during the Battle of Karagangul. 
falling to hold the line against the warriors of the Dwarf Hold, the Skaven Grey Seer attempting to summon an avatar of the Horned Rat, accidentally summoned the Great Scarbrand, whose unnatural demonic presence drove dwarfs and Skaven alike into a horrifying blood frenzy and began to fight and slaughter all about them. The carnage was only stopped when Master Engineer Clarak Bronzehammer set off demolition charges that sundered a colossal statue of Alea, burying the majority of the crazed horde. I am the Spine Crusher, the Skull Taker, the Blood Quencher! Now the time has come to reap what has been sown. The true test awaits. Ah, the ground shook. Over and over, with the thundering sound of hundreds of thousands of warriors on the march. True warriors of chaos. Up in the skies, fire burned the heavens, and damnation fell upon the enemy that foolishly stood in our way. <laughs> on the head of this mighty army, was him, the one who makes the very skies quake with fear. Archaon. Cannonballs flew through the air, slaughtering many of us with cowardly tactics. But unrelenting was our horde. Steel, steel, gunpowder, all of those opposed us and the very culmination of those things rammed into our lives. A steam tank pushed his way past the front line, using its mighty weight and girth. But it was met by chanting, Archaon, Archaon. The Lord of War had stopped the metal beast. Tackling the steel monster to the ground with otherworldly strength and power, slaughtering all of those inside. The chanting got louder and louder. Their blood we spilled all across the battlefield. Some heroes battle on. Too stubborn to realize all hope is lost. Their time is past, and the new age of chaos and dismay beckons. Archeon truly is a warrior who did the unthinkable and succeeded where thousands of other champions of chaos had failed. Wielding a huge flaming sword named Slayer of Kings, the ever-chosen of Chaos rides atop Dorgar, his own massive demonic horse that breathed fire and is larger than any other warhorse in existence. He is the martial perfection of Slanesh, the sturdiness of Nurgle, the rage of Khorne, the spellcrafting of Zeech. The very gods themselves compete for his favor, his adoration, his soul. But he denies them these things. He negates them the pleasure, as the Everchosen is truly undivided. And although he recognizes the Chaos Gods as the true forces that rule the cosmos, he will not devote himself to any single Chaos God. Archeon is the thirteenth and last Everchosen of Chaos. Of all the beings that have been able to become the Everchosen of Chaos, 
of all who have assailed the world over the ages, Archaon is by far the most ruthless and perhaps the most powerful of them all. I will prove once more that I am the ever chosen, for I am the anointed, the bringer of woes, the one true Lord of Chaos! The ever chosen is the destruction of the world made flesh. But to understand such a being, we must go back to the very start of his journey. Before there was Archaon, the three eyed king, before he took, by right of might, the six legendary treasures of chaos and was coronated as the Ever-Chosen, there was Diederik Kastner. Diederik was born in Nordland shortly after the First Great War against Chaos. He was the offspring of a Norskin raider attacking his mother during those tumultuous times. He had blood both from the North and from the South, as was foretold in ancient prophecies. As the years passed, he became a member of the Order of the Twin-Tailed Orb, and he was mentored by a priest named Dagobert. Diederik was a fully devoted servant of the Order, and with dedication and commitment, he later became a Knight Templar, fighting faithfully in the service of the God King Sigmar Heldenhammer. But he was eventually cursed by knowledge. He learned the truth about his fate and heritage, and his mind and heart were suddenly conflicted, as his foundations and his faith were suddenly shaken to the core. Travelling many miles looking for an answer, he arrived upon the massive holy temple of Sigma in Altdorf. Then and there, the confused and troubled Knight Templar knelt before the golden statue of Sigma and begged for a sign, for a relief from the darkness that now consumed his mind. Desperately, he begged Sigmar for an answer, but none came. The golden statue of the God King was lifeless. No sign was given to Diederik, and the man stood there, in silence, embracing his doom. He knew it was hopeless to keep looking for answers, and he renounced his service to Sigmar and his beliefs in the gods of the South. But still, he hated the dark gods of his father. Thus, the half Norskin, resentful of the cruel fate the Chaos Gods had reserved for him, stood ready to fulfill his destiny. His quest was a mighty one indeed, and the road ahead was, perhaps, the most dangerous a man has ever threaded. But he would not falter. The very gods themselves watched as Diederik Kastner, the Templar of Sigma, die, and a new person yet to be forged, took his place. Forged from the other world, six treasures shall he possess. Upon his head the crown shall see all, and open eyes will prove woe to mortal kind. Then shall he ride unto the world. Then will the world know that the last war has begun. For over a century did he travel across the world with his loyal steed. Archaon knew that to become the Ever Chosen and seal his destiny, he needed to begin by getting the legendary Mark of Chaos an extremely powerful rune that dreadfully granted power on the behest of all the four Chaos Gods. It combined all of the perks and blessings of the individual marks of Chaos all into one artifact. His prize was in Nagaroth, and to that cold place he took a warband of hardened warriors with him. The Swords of Chaos, these men were called. There Archeon made his way into the altar of ultimate darkness, with the intention of offering himself to the Chaos Gods. He battled his way through a citadel so dark that no light could be counted on to mark the way. Indeed, when one of his warriors attempted to light a torch, 
it was snuffed out immediately, consumed by the pure blackness of that unnatural place. But Archeon was not afraid, and marched on further into the pit's black. He entered the all-encompassing abyss, and there he fought multiple creatures, unknown beings, impossible monsters, all of them. He lost his loyal steed against the multiple claws and tentacles that grasped and slashed. Fighting for hours until blissfully blind, Archeon slaughtered them all in return, and offered their hearts to the gods of chaos. Thus, re-establishing that ancient place of evil worship, he walked out of the altar, soaked in blood, with a mighty mark of chaos burning on his forehead. Next on his list of conquests was the most powerful set of armor ever beget by the Chaos Gods, the Armor of Morkar. The protective set worn by the very first ever chosen. Onto unknowable depths of the ocean he and his warband set sail, on a stolen ship of black metal pulled by a mighty sea drake. They reached a mysterious land found in no document of cartography, where half-human creatures dwelt. Their skin was as pale as snow, and they fought against Archeon and the invaders. Six days, six bloody days of fighting was all it took to destroy the local half-humans and their city, which was reduced to rubble. Deep within their necropolis, Archeon found the tomb of Morkar. There he fought the vengeful spirit of the fallen champion, who reanimated his old set of armor. The jewel was long and mighty, but the spirit of Morkar lost, and the set of armor was bestowed upon the winner. Nigh invulnerable, he set out to conquer his next prize, the Eye of Syrian which granted prophetic powers and almost complete awareness of the near future to its user. The mighty artifact was part of the massive treasure hoard of a chaos dragon named Flamefang, who guarded it beyond all other things. The weak serve and the strong take, such is the law of this world, and Archeon is the strongest there ever was. With his mighty axe he laid claim to the Eye of Shirian. The dragon and the man battled hard at the base of the Cliff of Beasts. The first true test of the recently acquired armor of Morkar came when a dragon completely swallowed Archeon. It was the armor that prevented him from being consumed by the dragon's terrible acidic juices and allowed the challenger to hack apart Flamefang and open him from the inside. Full of blood and the dragon's guts, Archeon claimed his prize by hanging the artifact around his neck. Archeon is the apocalypse made manifest, but the apocalypse does not walk, it does not run, he rides. And for that he would claim Dorgar, the Steed of Doom, a demonic being so foul it was used as a set piece in the collection of bizarre creatures of the demon prince Agramon. Fighting his way against the demons and creatures guarding Agramon's palace, Archeon was able to get into that mysterious place. There he saw the nigh maddening beings that should not exist according to the laws of this or any world. Beasts that were part man, part insect, and part mammoth. Shapeless beings that came back and forth from this world and the next. There were no benevolent gods or forces in that place, for if they existed, they would surely not allow some of these monsters to be. Eventually, after looking past innumerable creatures of all forms, Archeon found Dorgar through his stench of sulfur. The steed burst into flames and changed into weird shapes as Archeon vaulted on his back. But the Chaos Warrior was able to break its will like a wild stallion and escape that terrible place. He will see why I am the Lord of the End Times, why I am the Ever Chosen, and why I will wield the Slayer of Kings! After that, 
Archaon sought the weapon to end all weapons, the Slayer of Kings. The blade used by Vangel, the second ever chosen of Chaos. It was hidden on top of the Chimera Plateau, where the creatures of its namesake gathered in great hordes. Archaon, along with three of his loyal companions, climbed and battled against the Chimeras, until reaching the top of the world. From there, Archaon could see the vast land below, and made the oath to one day rule it all. As they hiked, the mountains itself rolled over, for it was alive. It turned out that the father of all dragon ogres, Krakenrock the Black, was the mountain. Not even the mighty Chaos Champion could fell such a foe. So he and his party walked silently, only to find that the sword was clasped into the huge beast's chest. Prince Ograx the Grand, the strongest companion of the Chaos Warriors, lifted one of the talons of the beast just long enough for Archeon to retrieve the mighty sword. But something unexpected happened in that moment. The greater demon Uzul was bound to the Slayer of Kings, and the blade began to make the loudest of shrieks as Krakenrock began to stir. Archaon saw no other option but to plunge the sword upon Ograx's heart, to quench the greater demon's thirst with royal blood. The shrieking stopped, and the party moved on, leaving the prince's dead body where it fell, his sacrifice well worth it. Decades passed after obtaining the Slayer of Kings and the other mighty artifacts, but to truly be complete, he still missed one. The Crown of Domination, a helm that originally bore the Eye of Shirian, but was now lost. He had no clue where the crown was, but the shadowy demon prince Belakor showed him the location, intending to steal it after the Chaos Champion failed his quest. The Great Helm was hidden on top of a great icy peak in the World's Edge Mountains, upon where the very first Chaos Warship had taken place. For a day and a half, he climbed the snowy peaks, and with the help of his demonic steed, he managed it, heavy armor and all. Suddenly, the potential Everchosen was in front of the mighty gates of the first Chaos Shrine to ever exist upon which each Chaos God would test his metal to see if he was truly worthy of being the Ever Chosen. The labyrinth started with pus and pox, as Nurgle sought to fell the great champion, but by willpower alone he fought off the greatest diseases and afflictions. Then the maze turned into crystalline mirrors, each showing a different reality to him, and the sight almost drove him insane, but such a mighty warrior could not be confused by these visions. He blindfolded himself, and carried on with sound, smell and touch guiding him. He carried on by instinct, and managed to get through the test imposed by Zeech. After that, his senses were all struck, at once, by the greatest sensations ever felt by any mortal, for now Slanesh. The Dark Prince of Excess would try to corrupt him. The greatest of rewards, the mightiest of pleasures, it was all worthless to him. And Archaon marched on, not allowing himself to be distracted by the thousands of temptations. It was then that he arrived in a great arena. It seemed that the sun itself had come down to meet him in combat, for the great glare burned away his skin and hairs. In reality, it was a mighty bloodthirster of Kor. The two fought with all their might. They traded blows that would split a mountain in twain. But eventually, the Chaos Warrior tackled the demon to the ground and strangled him with his own barbed whip. What he stood in front of him was the simplest of shrines, 
with a throne behind it, upon which sat a skeleton with the crown of domination on its skull. Archeon took the skull and raised it to the skies. He had done it. He had gathered all six artifacts of chaos. Belakor, eternal enemy of the gods, was forced to perform the coronation upon the new Everchosen of Chaos, as he had done time and time again. But this time it was different, as it would be the last. Archeon had completed his mighty quest, and was crowned by the gods as the Lord of the End Times. The last remnant of his own humanity died. Diedrich Kastner was no more. Archeon was then unleashed upon the world, and he proceeded to gather the mightiest and darkest army ever seen. As sure as the sun is to rise every morning, as sure as chaos is to corrupt the hearts of men. So soon the hour of fate comes around, the ever-chosen stirs from his dark throne and prepares the blow that shall split the world asunder. Realms of old have fallen, lost beneath the fury of the Northlands, or smothered by vermin from below. Doom preachers and madmen now shout on the street alike, all rambling about the fate of the world. This is, indeed, nothing new in the city of Altdorf, but something seems to be odd this time. There are now more of them. In every corner of every street, one can hear the ramblings of a flagellant preacher all saying the same thing. The end is nigh. Does our most holy father Reward those who take the easy road? Does he traffic in temptation? Of course not! Sigma rewards hard work, resolve in the face of temptation, and, above all, courage when confronting mortal danger. My friends, the easy path leads to corruption, to damnation, to perdition. Only through suffering can you ever see the glory that is the truth, that is the founder of our glorious empire, that is our divine father, Sigma! The more aggressive ones get carried off by the city guards, only to be substituted as soon as they are gone. And week after week this has been going on. The taverns and bars and inns grow quieter and even the most enthusiastic of drunken folk is shut by the tension in the air. The times are bleak in the Empire, and the air is choked with hopelessness and dread. For many moons have the people noticed the vanishing of cattle, or the birth of the animals as mutated monsters. Just today, we learned of a damned being that was born in the middle of the night. He had no tongue, yet he could scream. He had no eyes, yet he could cry. The poor bastard was put out of his misery with fire until nothing was left but a smoking black pulp. A man in Nuln has reportedly awoken this morning to find a pale and fleshy hand growing out of his own chest. And all around the land of the Empire, entire households are being burned at the stakes for making covenants with the Dark Gods in these desperate times. The people are afraid to walk beneath the canopy of the forests that divide many of the settlements of our lands, for the creatures that dwell there have grown even more violent and bold recently. It is a matter of fact now. The armies of Chaos are on the move, and the steppes of Kislev have already felt their fire and brimstone. The end comes! and he rides upon a steed of fire with two tails. A wave of darkness rides in his wake. The Dark Templar comes to slaughter our gods. Beware! The end comes for all of us. Rumors are that the hated Kurgans have come down from their freezing wastes in the north to make battle with the Kislevites. The more skeptical amongst the populace are quick to shut this down, 
saying that the barbarians were busy fighting each other to meaningfully unify. But this is indeed the truth. Their numbers are larger than ever, and I know that more and more dire reports are coming from the north. I can only wonder what these messages really say. The nights grow colder, and the days grow brief. Doors are locked and barred, windows are closed, not to be opened again, and nailed shut. There was one name in the lips of those who still rambled, Archeon. But they did not last, for the witch hunters burned many a would-be a preacher upon pyres of holy fire. But these actions have not stopped the fear we all have in our hearts. The dread that has settled over not only the Empire, but the entire world. And they were indeed right to fear, for he comes atop a steed of doom and flame. From the far north he comes. Archeon. The Ever Chosen. When we learned of the Chaos Host approaching, we lit our network of torches at the top of our mountains, and we mustered whatever forces we could. We managed to get a few patrol groups, and we drew a few hundred from the city itself. But we didn't know the enemy would come in such terrible numbers. And that unnatural creatures from the warp would come with them. The enemy had monsters of impossible size that marched close to them, driven by an otherworldly hunger and desire to kill. Their chaos knights charged against our ranks with sheer ferocity. We tried to contain them as hard as we could, but it seemed like a vain effort, and I saw many good men die in the attempt. We charged them many times with our powerful cavalry, but it was not enough, not enough to stop their advance. They even had greater demons by their side. They obeyed the will of the other chosen, and they killed relentlessly. Eventually, we were pushed back into the cold waters of the river, and they stained it with our blood. We fought for our lands, and for our own lives, we fought with the running water up to our chests, and still they pushed on. Our supporting lines of fire were crushed to bits by their massive cannons from hell. They blasted us apart with their balls of the eldritch fury, and the impacts disintegrated flesh, bone, and armor. A few of us could barely escape from that deadly host of chaos. But only thanks to the selfless sacrifice of many of our brothers that died on that battlefield and in that damned river. Buying us precious time for us to escape at the last moment when we knew all was lost. The snowy plains were tainted with Kislevite blood. The river ran red on that day. Entire civilizations have fallen at the hands of Archeon. The Herald of the Apocalypse is now coming to bring the end times to the world and reduce it all to ashes and rubble. Who is there to stop him? Who are we to deny the cruel destiny that awaits us? How is the world supposed to be saved against he who is chosen by the gods?
On this channel, we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also join Patreon and earn extra perks while supporting the videos to come. Find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe, and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.